Hello, this is Josh Carr with The Real Angle, and today we'll be talking to Paul R R Rabinovich. Pardon me, don't mean to fumble on my own words. Uh, how are you doing today, Paul? I'm great. It's great to be with you. Thanks, Josh. Great. Excellent. So I guess the first thing to address is you are a senior advisor at a family office, and the family office will stay unnamed for purposes of this conversation. Um, Let's talk a little bit about why that is, what a family office is, sort of start the conversation from there. Because I think a lot of people don't even understand what a family office is. Sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. So this is uh, the third family office that I've worked for uh, over the last 10 years. <clears throat> and you know, essentially a family office serves the investment needs of I guess you could call them ultra high net worth uh, families. They could be, I don't know if there's a hard and fast rule of how much money you need to have in order to qualify for that. I would say 500 million or more. Uh, the families I've worked for have been billionaires. Um, and the, essentially, you know, the, the family office is there because the family doesn't feel that their investment interests are served by sort of the big wirehouses and, and the products that they are being sold by those wirehouses. They, they want to customize it. They have enough wealth, they have enough AUM that they can hire their own teams to execute on the, the kind of investments they want to make. Right, so, why, why, why use JP Morgan if you can just hire a bunch of ex-JP Morgan guys, pay them salaries correct. plus a holiday bonus and get arguably better service because now they're your guys, not JP Morgan's guys. Right, and, you know, and the, the arguments I, I think I think are well founded that you might have better uh, access to better deals. You you may be more nimble, uh, and you'll have a lower fee basis in coming in and out of deals. Um, so the the family offices that I've been invest uh, working with have are diversified. Uh, they usually have a private equity team, a private credit or lending team. Uh, in the uh, over the last decade, I've been building and managing the real estate team. And in one particular case, there was also a real assets team that invested in uh, timber and farmland that I kind of worked side by side with. And then many of them also have private, uh, private, uh, sorry, public markets team uh, managing stocks, bonds, and you know, public, uh, public equities and things like Norm that. Normal security stuff. So, so like your right. real estate team, how big is your real estate team? Uh, uh, currently, the real estate team is two people, uh, okay. but I've worked on, um, I've managed teams that have been as large as uh, five or six. Right. And um, I guess a lot of it comes down to also for the family, what their particular interests are, uh, if they're hot or cold on real estate, for whatever reason. <laughs> And you know their family offices. Uh, also, they there's a there's a saying in the family office world, Josh. It's uh, if you've met one family office, then you've met one family office. Um, meaning we come in all stripes, all colors, all types. Sure. So there are there are family offices that only invest in funds and don't go in, directly into deals. Um, and then there are family offices like of the sort that I've been working with that are working on joint venture and direct acquisitions all the time and very a very little exposure to funds. And so that that plays a role in how much staff you need. You know, funds, fund one, management, one, asset management, simpler. <laughs> one yeah. fun, one family office I'm uh I know a colleague of mine works for one. Uh they have a lot of fine art, you know, because basically one of the family members was a collector. So then it kind of became, well, not only do we collect the art, but we also do, you know, it's like another investment class, if you will, of alternative yeah. investing and uh it was nice to visit his office because it was beautiful i mean it was it was <laughs> i know enough about my fine arts to be like wow that's that's a real one and that's expensive yeah. <laughs> i don't expect to see that on you in your reception area but okay i guess that's what you're hanging yeah. on the wall good for you you know yeah. so no it, it's interesting stuff so so how long have you been at the current one that you're at um just started the uh, beginning of this year, 2023. Cool. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit about investment theses from the real estate side. What is it that you, we talked a little bit before, but wh what kind of real estate deals ring the bells, if you will, of this particular family office? Yeah, uh, well, uh, I'm going to take a step back and explain a little bit more about what I've been doing for 10 years and then maybe uh, answering that question will better. have more context. Uh, so the family offices that I've been working for for the last decade are all what's called impact invest investment focused. 
uh, meaning that they're looking for more than just a financial return. You know, their mandate to us on the investment team is we want to see a, a market normal return together with and uh, equally together with some sort of social be socially beneficial return. Okay. Um, you need to be doing well and good with uh, with the money that we're entrusting for you to invest. So, you know, that's that's a big criteria. You know, we, we, we can't, according to our mandate, we can't or shouldn't be presenting deals in investment committee that are just just market. You know, like if, if we invest in this, we're going to do a sort of a conventional deal and it'll turn, uh, you know, a 20 IRR and it'll be great. That that would be denied. That'd be like, no, you're not doing anything that's socially beneficial. You know, we don't right. we don't want and that in the portfolio. Anyone can buy <laughs> shopping centers. You could just buy a bunch of shopping centers in that case. Sure. Right. Now so the the socially beneficial areas that I've been working in uh most you know for this year uh, intensely focused on and the last few years before that have been the environmental side is um uh, acquiring and developing highly sustainable real estate assets. And by highly sustainable, I mean lead platinum would be our basement, and we go from there. So trying to get to net zero energy uh, type of buildings, buildings that do not um, consume more energy than they produce themselves. And there's a balance highly, of your energy. Highly, highly insulated, well-located to take advantage of sunlight, solar, <laughs> wind, some sort of alternative form of generation. Correct. Cetera. Correct. Cool. So that's been a pri that's been a primary focus, and actually, I just finished writing a book on that subject. Uh, in that should be out in the next month or so. It's called Investment Opportunities in Decarbonizing Real Estate. It's kind of a mouthful, but it <laughs> tells you what it is. I, I sh who's the publisher? I should ask. Who's the publisher? Well, the publisher is a uh, it's a consortium of family offices that all all the family offices invest in the environment, and it's called yeah. the Creo Syndicate. CREO okay. that they are publishing it and it's uh the deal we made is that the membership will get first look at the book and then I I get it after that and can distribute it to whomever you'll get, get a copy on Amazon and I can I can buy a copy on Amazon so no, that's cool <laughs> no, that's man, cool I'll send it to you I'll, I'll send it to you it's just it'll like, be digital though I'm not printing anything that would be against the, it's the it's the perks of running uh, perks of running a podcast you get a free book so it's uh it's good you know it's not getting paid for this, just doing it because I enjoy it. So it's that's that's good. Free books, always good. Um, yeah. Not that this so, matters, but we'll get good. Look, keep going, keep going. Yeah. So, so impact going back to, to the question that that you were asking about before is because we're because we have this particular view and goal that we have in our investments, it tends to elongate our investment horizon. So our okay. so so there's a couple there's a couple things I would say to answer your original question about what are we looking to do. Uh, the first thing is we're looking more at 10 or 15 year investment horizons, and we're not so much on the, the private equity five to seven year time frame, just trying to drive IRR. Our families are multi-generational, we think in that way. And so it's really actually, uh, it's an old school real estate way of thinking about, you know, the assets that we're building or, or buying is like just never sell, you know, build, you know, try to manage them to optimize your cash flow, return, return a strong cash on cash return and look for a high equity multiple on refinancing and uh, maybe sale if you want to, right? At it's just, point. it's a different, yeah, it's a different come from than I think a lot of other real estate players. And I think a lot of family offices think the same way. They, they're, they're trying to build wealth for the family. They're not just trying to get rich, right. And generate a, you know, an IRR. Right. It's generation after generation. I mean, yeah, I mean, no, it's a good point. I mean, with a private equity shop, they want to be able to get to cash quickly because they need to pay their investors and then the investors want to redeploy in something with you guys. You know, you're not assumingly you're not going anywhere. I mean, if you're already a wealthy family, you will theoretically continue yeah. to stay wealthy. So you just want to move things yeah. in the right direction. And and there you go. Yeah. Um. So. Let's talk a bit more about the impact investing thing. So what product types are you guys finding to be most like most in line with the net zero thing? Is it apartment housing? Is it office buildings? What, what's yeah. what, what's sort of working well, right now? In over the course of the last 10 years, I have built a multifamily office, a single family for rent, senior housing all to 
to to an aspiring net zero standard. And you know, I I think just just to be really transparent and fair about it is that this is what a lot of people should understand that when when you design a building, you know, you you you're designing a building with a bunch of modelers and 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 engineers who are saying, well, we think that when you know Josh takes his office and Paul takes his office, they're going to use this amount of energy per office. They're going to plug in this number of units, and they're they're going to keep you're going to keep your temperature at you know seventy two, right? Sure. But it turns out that you know some of those assumptions are wrong, and that every single building needs to be fine tuned based on people. Right. right. Some people like the room hot, some like it cold. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So every single building, like on on plan, they will be net zero. In practice, we always have to like re reconnoiter, rejudge, you know, and, and sometimes we miss, you know. Just I, I worked in an office years ago where to keep with the stereotype, the women were always too cold and the men were always too warm. And then yeah. the six of us, we were in this big open plan area. There were like six or seven of us. And we decided as a group that because of where the air conditioning vents were, we were going to put all the women on one side of the room and all the men on the other side of the room, like it was a junior high school dance or something. And we all collectively agreed not to tell HR because we're like, if we tell HR, they're going to yeah. kill somebody. <laughs> but you know what? Everyone was happy. The women were on one they side, were. the men were on the other side. Uh, the temperature issue went away and problem solved. So, so right. Right. I totally appreciate that people have their preferences. People have their preferences. Yeah. So, so, so you've done a range of product types, which is yes. great. And the net zero thing, I mean, it definitely is something that from what I can tell, um, just for physical location, definitely more of a conversation, I think, in Europe than it's been in the United States. Like this is something that we're, we're catching up on, if you will. Um, Cause they, they're already there. Like the Germans are already like, Go go team, we're making. They're five zero. I tell people they're five years ahead of us, you know. And when the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Accord for four years, that made a material difference. The European countries kept going. They created their own regulatory requirements. They told building owners um, what what they wanted from the built environment, and off they went. And we're catching up. <laughs> right, right. Frankly. And yeah. unfortunately, and this is my own two cents, it seems like we've really politicized the conversation rather than just simply, hey, no one likes to waste money. So why are you spending money on energy if you don't have to? You know, yeah. I mean, it's just stupid, yeah. regardless of right yeah. or left wing, just like stop wasting money. I mean, like this yeah. just seems like a very right. natural statement to make. So th this is interesting. Now, physical locate like markets. So you're with this family office. Uh, do they have a preference? Like they like to invest in Florida because they're from Florida. Is there that part of the conversation, or they're just all over the U.S. and whatever? Yeah, great question. So no, they're agnostic. They trust us to pick markets. Okay. Uh, the only the only sort of I guess you'd say directive on that is to be is to be intentional and intelligent about the resilience of the markets that we're choosing. So Southern Florida, uh, New Orleans would probably not be markets, even if I love them as, you know, they're, they're growing the, you know, the, the base of employment is growing like crazy, sure. probably wouldn't get approved. If I go to Minneapolis or Chicago or, or Denver, a uh, different story where right. I have, yeah, I have, I mean, just, uh, yeah, I have, relationships and data sets that are driving some of these decisions saying what are the besides like the normal real estate factors of job growth and population growth and de demographics and so forth i also have climate resilience data and sure. climate what i call climate readiness data looking at insurance and lending and where they're going uh that directs the market that also informs the markets that i'm selecting which, in all fairness, so, I think a lot of people have tuned into. I mean, you look at insurance rates in Florida. Uh, I think everyone yeah. is fully aware of the fact, hey, hurricanes are a problem and they're getting worse. So, you know, yeah. maybe this yeah. is an issue. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, it's interesting. My it's interesting. moving forward is it's only gonna, going to increase that way. In, it, both insurance and lenders are thinking really hard about this, and they're, they're not going to take on more risk than both more climate risk than they want to. They're, they're not doing it. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's real. 
it's real cost. It's real. It's real money yeah. at this point. No, it's real money. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm blessed in that I live in New Jersey, which you know, in theory, was not affected by a lot of the stuff. But then Hurricane Sandy woke up everybody, and said, right. "Well, yeah, we're not Florida, but you know, we get hurricanes too, and they can do an outrageous amount of damage." So, you know, that's basically means the entire eastern seaboard has issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so on so let's talk about deals. So on a recent deal you did. What made it work? Like, let's talk about the impact. So you're doing this impact investing thing, I guess. Yeah. How are you finding these deals? Because this is not like this is not just go to CBRE and buy a shopping center. So how are you finding them? How are they finding you? Right. How does that what does that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I guess, you know, my filter is different than a lot of others maybe even maybe even reversed is a lot of others who are in, in a in a allocator seat will pick their market and say you know I love Austin Texas I'm going to Austin uh terrific market let's let's go find the best project we can right mine is different because um well what we just discussed about market selection but I also and my experience over the last decade is I also need to choose the right partners um, and the right assets. So I'm looking for a very particular partner or a very particular asset that we think we can improve, meaning it already has to be aligned with our interest of getting to net zero or aligned with our interest in being highly sustainable. My experience in working with conventional developers, no matter how talented they are, and trying to have them produce a new product to them is is frankly abysmal. <laughs> it's been terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just... Just no, they don't. They don't want to go there. Uh, they don't understand it. It's not. They don't have a passion for it. Yeah, it's, and that that's a fair statement. That's a fair statement. I mean, a lot of people, I yeah. think, see. I mean, unfortunately, you know, the term greenwashing gets used, right? That you basically say, yeah. well, we're going to slap the word lead on it. That'll make people happy, and right. throw some bike racks up, and we're good. You know. Yeah. And yeah. whether or not that actually makes any sense has an economic impact or it's just a name to slap on it because your corporate user wants to be able to say they're in a lead building. Whereas right. you're talking more true believer type stuff. Like we're really going to do yeah. this. We're going to sweat the details. We're going to care. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And they don't, you know, it, it, it happens every so often or it's happened over the last time that they, they're like, yeah, 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 we get it. You want to be green. And then we'll get to a certain point in the negotiations or like maybe it's our, you know, we're, we're working on, you know, the, the waterfall. And I'll be like, well, if you don't hit this kind of a building, you're not going to get your promote. And then it's like, you know, hit the brakes. Whoa. Right. What do you mean? I was like, you think I was kidding? <laughs> you it's know? still mad. Why would the deal I... <laughs> still needs to work. It, it needs yeah. to work, but you have, you have more of a mission. No, it's interesting because, right. I mean – one challenge I'd imagine you have, and this is just me guessing, I mean, you're a family office. You've got a lot of money to deploy. You need a developer who's big enough that they're doing big enough projects that you can deploy a meaningful amount of money. Um, yeah. And, I mean, if you don't mind, like, what's typical equity, like, what size deals are we talking here? Minimum minimum first deal would be $10 million equity. Right. Okay. Um, so that's a decent size check. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, so it's like if you're doing that, you need a guy who is obviously not junior. They played in better yeah. deals. They have some experience, but they also yeah. need to be believers in this product. And that, that, yeah. that, that those those two circles sound like they're kind of hard to find the overlap. That's true. There's way more talent doing smaller size deals in the U.S. than there is larger players, almost institutional players doing these kind of deals. Right, because otherwise if you I, just go to a Heinz or a Tishman and say, here's $50 million, and they'd be like, great, here's a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Interesting. that's right. Interesting. Yeah. Now, now yeah. I, I, see, I see the challenge. So we talked about what deals work for you. We talked about what deals in theory are good, but maybe not for you guys. Um, so nothing ever works out as expected, for good or for bad. A uh, question I always like to ask people, um, surprises you've had along the way either happy or sad surprises i'll take either i always like to ask well um one of the, i'll tell you this quick case study that uh it's a happy surprise for us uh happy is good and i uh, wasn't very happy for uh well i'll tell you the story it's Please. in boulder colorado um okay. and we developed 
uh, 150,000 square feet of net zero energy office and around 150 apartments also net zero energy. Cool. Um, we selected Boulder, Colorado as it has a high uh, climate resilience. It's, you know, other than wildfires, it doesn't have a whole lot of <clears throat> issues confronting it as we as we go forward with climate transition and has high climate readiness. And it also has, you know, I, I, one of the things that I haven't mentioned before, I should mention now is there should be a, like a product, a product market fit. In Boulder, if I produce a net zero energy office building, I know I'm going to have companies that want to rent there. No, I've been to if Boulder. I, produce... I mean, keep Boulder <laughs> weird. I mean, it's it's the hippies in Colorado. I get it. They, they would care right. about it. And that's part of the value system. Yeah. And if I built the same building in Houston or Dallas, maybe not so much. Demand, less energy, right? le less interest. Not to beat up on my colleagues from Texas, but yes, a lot <laughs> less interest in Houston, Texas. Definitely. That's right. Definitely. So, so Boulder, Boulder office, uh, it's a pretty large investment, Boulder office and multifamily investment, one particular neighborhood. Um, we broke ground, uh, at the same time as friends of mine, colleagues really broke ground on multifamily right across the street from us, directly across the street, built at the same time while we were all in construction, um, the city of Boulder dramatically lowered their building energy code requirements, Okay. uh, by yeah, I don't remember exactly, but maybe 25, 30%. Buildings need to perform 25 or 30% lower than the previous standard. Interesting. Um, and that was because so, they wanted to make them more affordable, or what was the... No, no, it, it was it was all based on, on uh, uh, the carbon emissions and trying to get the city of Boulder to be net zero by... Well, I don't, oh, I'm sorry. There, okay, I, I flipped it around for a moment. Okay, so they're saying use less energy. Got it. Okay, sorry. Right. The city of, like, you know, this is, there's a trickle down, right? Like, the country says we're going to be net zero by 2050, live up to the Paris agreements, and then, you know, and then the states will, will kind of make the same commitment. This You see this happening in California. Sure. And then the municipalities, it all trickles down. Sometimes it trickles up in the states uh, <laughs> where. No, but some cities want to be more progressive than others. It depends. Right. So Denver, Denver and Boulder are both those kind of cities, right? And so right. That, that's together with others. So long story short on this is that our buildings, because we had set out with the intention of being net zero energy, we were below the code, below the code by a, a safe, a very safe margin and right. no, basically no penalty to us that we don't have to invest in any new solar panels or we don't have to do any more insulation. My friends across the street though, um, now have a time clock on them over the next two years. They need to figure out how they're going to reduce, even though they built it to code, it was the old code, <laughs> they need. They now have a time frame where they need to invest in their buildings and improve the windows, put on new solar panels or stuff. It's CapEx that wasn't in their original underwriting is, is my point. And it's always more uh, expensive than if you had just done it day one. You could have always added another six inches of spray foam or something. That right. It's always easier to do it before you're halfway there. And I say that as the owner right. of a house that was built in the 1890s, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. retrofitting. Yeah. You know, it's it's not a question of getting to the best state. It's it's always muddling along. Uh, right. So I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, uh, so that same dynamic is, you know, it's playing out in New York City is, you know, with local law 97 is playing out in Washington, D.C. and Boston, Denver, Boulder, you know, and, right. and it's, I think it's going to be, I mean, my the thesis moving forward with the, the family office I'm working with now is that we're going to see more of this and we should position ourselves to take advantage of, of what I think is going to be a trend that is going to continue for a decade or more. And then with stuff like this, I mean, since you're a long term investor, I imagine when you're working with developers and just to get into the finances and the mechanics of it, you know, local developer comes in, brings you guys in as the equity partners. Are you then owning it long term with them? Are you doing like a crystallization event where you buy them out or they buy you out? Or how does that because a lot of times developers are just like, I built it, I sell it, I make my money. You're looking yeah. to own these assets long term. Yeah, it uh, both. Uh, it depends. Every case is different. Both uh, we we run into both kinds of developers. There's always a crystallization event built into our agreements. So if if they would like to uh, to get out of the deal, there there's a door provided. <laughs> but uh, right. or if they want to ride along, then you own a new building, and that's great. And right. you get cash flow. Yeah. Worst things that yeah. could happen of your free time. So right. um, 
broader economy issues, interest rates have spiked. Uh, they seem to be, as of the taping of this, which is mid-November 23, seems to be stabilizing. Seems like interest rates are chilling out a little bit. Does that affect yeah. you guys? Like, how, how does that affect you? Because family office is a long-term player, if you will. I mean, obviously it affects you, but like, how much does that enter the conversation? Yeah, it's a great question. It doesn't really affect the assets that are currently in the portfolio. I mean, first of all, we're very low leverage, you know, that, uh, you know, we're 45% debt, you know, 50 sometimes, but not that high. So it, it's, you know, that that's one aspect. You're not that, handing the you know, keys back to the bank at 50 LTV. Yeah. I mean, it's, you're right. fine. You're fine. Right. Uh, so that's, that's part one of it. Um, we try to get into the most advantageous long-term Fannie or Freddie, you know, financing as soon as we can based on stabilization. So those, some of those assets are already like they're fine for, for a while. And, you know, so, so those, that's from the asset management side, the moving, the moving forward side, I mean, it's all timing and we don't have to move on anything. So to be candid, we're not building anything right now. Um, it's a more, of uh, like most family offices that I talk to and most of the family offices that I'm, you know, sort of in, in regular dialogue with is keeping our powder dry and waiting for great buying opportunities, which we think will happen because of the interest rates and people who are over leveraged and like special services will call or developers, you know, who are in trouble and need an equity infusion or some sort of bridge. That's what we're waiting for. And they're going to be a lot, there's going to be a lot of that in 24. Uh, a lot yeah. of the conversations I have with people seem to be, you know, that they're, everyone's waiting for the other shoe to drop, so to speak. Um, and uh, it will. Yeah. I just, you know, when is your guess as much as mine? So, yeah. so longer term plans for the entity, I mean, you're waiting for 24 and that's great, but is the, I mean, is there an overarching vision beyond i mean the impact real estate is obviously a vision but is it like you're going to build a portfolio of office buildings and roll it out in a reit are there any sort of grand visions if you will yeah that's a great it's a great question um yes and no you know okay. we when we when we present our <clears throat> strategic plans either asset or portfolio there's always a view towards an eventual exit but that's always like at the discretion of, of the family. It's not, you know, I, I can always make a recommendation, like now's the time to sell, but that or may the not top be. of the curve. <laughs> sure. But, right. right. So to your, to your question is uh, our conviction is that owning a stabilized and strong portfolio of net zero energy uh, buildings is a great investment standalone. And there is a potential that somebody larger than us, the Black Rocks of the world, will sure. want to buy the whole thing from us at some point and and pay us and pay us for it. You know, sure. No, a, we, a, we think... a tornado could come along and say you got a bunch of great office buildings. Uh, yeah. uh, an apartment re could say you've got thirty garden apartment complexes and just roll it up into the into the monster. Sure, that's right. Sure, sure. Sure. And so when you look at going back to something you said earlier is when you look at the European exist uh, experience, yeah. uh, you see that now you see two things. Uh, well, three things, really. You see that the at least on the office side, not so much on the multifamily on the office side, the lease up rates are accelerated for for the green products because those companies want to be in those spaces. And so they're like, we need to make our scope one, scope two, scope three you know, add up, you know, for our, for our, when we roll up our corporate reports. So we right. need that kind of office. We're taking it. There's, you know, there's like very little supply on the market and a lot of demand. So lease up rates are faster. Your, you, your rental rates are, you got a, a little bit of a bump on your rental rates. Same, same basic dynamic, dynamic happening, supply and demand imbalance. And then we're seeing compressed cap rates, you know, not, not huge, 25 bits, 50 bits of, improvement for on the sale of these kind of assets so but that's real money i mean that could easily yeah. pay for, i mean i don't know it varies but i mean you know if you're getting an extra 50 bips that could be paying for the the upfront cost of doing the project in the first place 
you know, then yeah. all of a sudden the extra insulation, whatever, you sell the building for more money, it's a win-win. Right. Yeah, right. it is. It is funny. You know, there is such a thing as free lunches. It, they do exist. Um, <laughs> they do exist. You know, I mean, yeah. there's the old uh, the old economics joke about two economics professors walking down the street and one sees a twenty dollar bill on the ground and he goes to reach for it. And the other guy says, no, don't do it, because if there were actually a twenty dollar bill on the ground, someone would have already gotten it. And <laughs> uh, and I've always thought about that whenever people talk about no free lunches i'm like that's not true you do sometimes <laughs> find money there there is such a thing um right so no your your point is well taken that if you could sell it for a better price on the out on the outside of it not because you're being political or progressive but just because simply it leases up faster and people pay you more money to be in that building you know for whatever right. reason may be it's a more attractive asset so Right. Why wouldn't you want to right. build something like, you know, it's like design. I mean, people like pretty things more than ugly things. I mean, good design's a nice thing, too. I mean, given the option, you know, yeah. people pay more money to be in a nice looking building. So, no, it makes a lot of sense. Now, this is exciting to talk about the impact real estate thing. Out of curiosity, and just sort of my last thought is, are there other, because when we first started talking about impact real estate, there are other ways that one can make a social impact, right? So I think about yeah. like low income housing projects where, you know, you're helping uh, disadvantaged communities with lower cost housing, that sort of thing. What yeah. other kinds of impact real estate do you see as a thing out there? There's environmental um, stuff, there's light tech stuff. What are other things that you see people when they say impact real estate? Workforce housing, trying to produce, uh, clean, good living spaces for the middle class um, who, who has an incredibly dwindling supply uh, and increasing demand. Uh, right. So workforce housing is, is a squarely an impact uh, type. I'd say um, opportunity zones, like played honestly, not the low hanging fruit type of opportunity zone investments. But what I mean by that is investing capital in, in, areas municipalities that haven't seen capital and improvements in decades sure blighted um, communities typically typically lower lower right exactly uh uh lower advantage advantaged communities you know that that you know could use new new investment like that no, I, I did that. an interview a couple of weeks ago with someone who works for bedrock detroit and their whole focus is just detroit. great company yeah and yeah. great company and detroit yeah just needs help <laughs> there's and yeah. that's not to beat up on detroit and that's not making fun of them you know a century decades of disinvestment all kinds of social ills they just need the help they just yeah need it. so yeah yeah interesting cool well look this has been very constructive um so if people want to reach out to you with an impact investing type project how do they find you guys uh just uh, yeah just uh, ping me on my on my email. It's very simple. It's Paul at Rabinovich dot me M E. <laughs> and Rabinovich so. is R A B I N O V I T C H dot me. Also, when I post this, there'll be a LinkedIn post. There'll be a link to uh, Paul's LinkedIn, so you can check him out there. And um, no, this has been very constructive. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Paul. And uh, if I know someone who's doing a a good project and needs a large equity check, uh, you were definitely my first call. <laughs> Thank you. Or wants to build one. <laughs> and that's that's the goal. Thanks again, Paul. Yeah. See you soon. Thanks, Josh. Great seeing you. Take care. Okay.